going to turn to our final speaker of the day, and I'm absolutely honored to be speaking now with Keith Webster, who is Dean of University Libraries at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, he was also additionally appointed as Director of Emerging and Integrative Media Initiatives in 2015. Uh, his bio is on our website and it's, it's so detailed. I, I just want to hit some of the highlights. Keith has been Vice President and Director of Academic Relations and Strategy for the global public publishing company, John Wiley and Sons. He was former Dean of Libraries and University Librarian at the University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, he's also been University Librarian at University at Victoria University in New Zealand, Head of Information Policy at the HM Treasury of London, Her Majesty's Treasury of London, and Director of Information Services at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Again, I, I there is so much expertise in your background, Keith. I'm going to invite our, our attendees today to review your background on our website. But in the meantime, um, let me turn to you and ask the first question of today as in, in this interview environment. Um, Effective data management is clearly critical for a variety of reasons. Variety of reasons. It's critical for the individual researcher. It's critical for the institution in terms of funding and recognition. Uh, it's critical for the next generation of scientists and researchers. So, what? Did you hear, what have you heard so far today um, as useful takeaways from today's program? Well, hi, Joe, and, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you. You, you forgot to mention that I was chair of the board of NISO at, at one stage, which um, actually was much more fun than many of the things that, that you mentioned in my background. Um, for me, one of the, one of the key funny things is is the dominance of marine science amongst some of the panelists and my very first job as a librarian was in a government marine science laboratory many years ago um, where i was actually helping deal with data management in an analog world but that's a story for another day uh, i think one of the interesting themes that has surfaced is that this event is focused on data management and in many ways, we can think about data management as being a process that can support researchers, whether they are conducting their work in an open environment or a closed one. For example, somebody who's working in a pharma company where data is not going to be shared because it's commercially sensitive and tied into patents and, and such things. Nevertheless, good data management is implicit in best practice. But all of our speakers have touched in some way upon openness. And I have long argued that open data alongside open access is simply a stepping stone towards open science. And over the last 18 months, the pandemic has raised our awareness firstly of the importance of science both in terms of basic research but also in terms of international cooperation and what we've learned during this period has been the importance of information sharing between researchers between policymakers between individual citizens through the process of open science and i think we really have recognized that the pandemic has served as an accelerant for many of the things that we have been laying the, the building blocks for for some time. And therefore, we are at a point where many of the themes that have been surfaced by our great speakers today 
are ready really to be unleashed. Uh, so what, um, you know, if, if I think about what surfaced today, I think we see that the policy environment is rapidly shifting. You know, we heard about the NIH and their forthcoming um, policy enhancement, which will kick in in 2023. I know that there are some in the data management or open data community that wish it was on a faster timeline, but um, clearly good policy takes time to implement. There's a lot more than simply saying, done with it. Um, but we are in an environment where those who fund research recognize that they hold a degree of influence over research. And as the NIH begins to move forward, we will see others follow, whether they are federal funders or foundations or charities or individual institutions. Uh, my first interaction with data management um, policies was with the Australian Research Council, which in 2007 was a fairly early mover in encouraging researchers to put in place plans to share their data. And as we see with the NIH, they have made that now a requirement. I think alongside that tightening of policy has been the maturity of the supporting infrastructure. And we've heard a lot today about things like the advances in the DMP tool, the um, you know, greater recognition or, or adoption of ORCID. And I think the other big theme that I've picked up on is just how much great work is being done around the country. You know, your speakers have all talked about you know, phenomenal work that's going on, and we can all learn so much by coming together and sharing what we're doing, sharing our struggles, uh, and advancing data sharing and hopefully um, open science for the benefit of society at large. So libraries have always had to manage the scope of the scholarly record as it emerged over time. And the, the scholarly record has changed over the, the centuries. So what have been the challenges for Carnegie Mellon that, that you faced in adapting to these new non-traditional outputs that needed to be uh, managed, curated, uh, protected? What, what workflows, what routines and general practices have, has your institution introduced in, in support of, of sharing the data? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Maybe, maybe I could frame that a little bit by just saying a few words about the evolution of the scholarly record. Um, libraries have been in the business of managing the scholarly record for centuries, but really it has been over the last quarter of a century that the most fundamental changes have been evident until the, the mid to late 1990s, our role really was focused on bringing the scholarly record onto our university campuses by acquiring books and journals and other analog materials to inform education and research in our universities. I'm speaking here from the perspective of university libraries. And in the late 90s, of course, much of that content began to be released in digital form. And we started the process of moving journal subscriptions from print titles that were on physical display and then bound and shelved to PDF versions of articles released through publishers' platforms. And more recently, we have been doing that with regularity in support of our acquisition of ebooks. But that digital shift that made that transition possible has also impacted 
the ways in which research is conducted. And today, a large amount of research on university campuses is conducted in a digital environment. And that creates an opportunity for us to view the scholarly record as expanding. And if we think about the traditional record as being the books and journals that I mentioned, what we now see is that the products of research that are created digitally, data being the obvious one, but also algorithms and code and other things that were mentioned by Carly earlier, those are all eminently capturable, storable, curatable, shareable, as are the products and activities after the research process, the reproducibility, reuse, and other things. And what we have had to do is put in place the expertise, the platforms, the workflow solutions to help our research community capture that expanded part of the scholarly record and do with it what they think best suits the needs of their research teams, their projects, their funders' obligations. And to make all of that possible, we have had to invest in upskilling our team, uh, bringing in new expertise, licensing, building, buying um, workflow tools, repository platforms, and the like, and thinking about optimal long-term storage. Inevitably, that brings with it questions of budget. And my sense, having worked in a number of countries, and I don't want to get too political here, but my sense is that the United States seems to be incredibly focused on unfunded mandates compared to other countries where the government recognizes that mandates kind of have a price tag. And we were very fortunate when I worked in Australia to receive good financial support from the government to build our first wave of repositories and other platforms. Here, we seem to be on the hook on our own. And it's interesting that what we see now is an environment where researchers can include the costs of data management in their grant proposals. I am not sure that we have been desperately thoughtful in how we help them cost that if they are to use institutional solutions and more importantly how we can grab our share of that funding as and when the grants are allocated and that's something that, that we recognize we're working on we see the same question as we implement transformative open access agreements how do we gain a, a share of researchers funding um maybe i i, I could just if, if, if you'll bear with me, Jill, just talk a little bit more about um, how we have situated our data management work institutionally. And I will say that one overarching theme that continues to trouble me a little bit is that for a lot of our research community, they think of the library as a big building full of books and with a passable coffee shop. And if they don't work in a book heavy discipline, they think that we um, went out of business for them as the internet picked up the delivery channel. And helping them understand what we can offer their needs today is perhaps our biggest challenge. And we've been doing a lot of work to understand how we are perceived on campus and how we can brand the library and the expertise of our faculty in the libraries as genuine partners and pioneers in the research process. But in doing so, what I, I think we have three threads that we work on. The first is our core data management services, where we are providing support in a broad sweep of research data management activities, including data management planning, data visualization, text and data mining, and so on. And I'm going to try to multitask, which may not be the best thing, but I'll try and drop some links into the chat um, as I do this. 
So we've got a, a broad range of data management tools. I'm also going to call out our um, lead expert, Hannah Gunderman, um, in this area, and, and Hannah may well be on this call. Uh, she has developed a wonderful series of YouTube um, videos, which I encourage you to look at. Um, and she also has a blog, which I, I will put in, in the, the chat later rather than spend time looking for it just now. But she has a, a blog called Tartan Datascapes, which is a running series on data management issues. The second thing I would mention is our data collaborations laboratory, which I certainly have open and I'm dropping into the chat now. And that is an important mechanism through which we connect our research community across disciplines and help those who produce data and those who wish to consume data. You know, we are the, the country's number one university in artificial intelligence. AI research desperately needs data to test um, the next phase of work. And our data collab is a great vehicle for helping build a strong data community. And the third thread is our work on open science, where we have a series of events, training programs. We are very active players in the um, data carpentry um, community and um, a bunch of tools. And there's much more about all of that in the link that I just dropped in. So a lot going on here. And my colleague, Brian Matthews, has, I think, just solved perhaps the Hannah Gunderman um, blogging situation. So thank you, Brian. Back to you, Jill. No, I'm grateful for all of the additional URLs, because, of course, I think one of the elements of the information community is that we do recognize that there are always other resources frequently better than the ones we immediately are aware of. So thank you for adding those. Um, we've heard a couple of references to the FAIR uh, principles all day. Uh, Carly mentioned them. Um, Clara just was like about them. From your perspective, there at Carnegie Mellon, have you seen uh, an increase in awareness in what's required of faculty in doing in handling data management? Is this something that uh, is the awareness there in the context of your institution? There is certainly a growing awareness of um, data management. I wouldn't want to claim any causality between that awareness and the release of the FAIR principles. Um, I think part of the awareness or the interest is being driven by funders. For example, the National Science Foundation, which is one of our biggest funders, and periodically will return grant applications to investigators saying, in, in a much more elegant way that I'm going to paraphrase it, and we love your proposal, your data management plan sucks, please fix that and resubmit. And word has got around the research community that the NSF really is focused on that. And those people who know about us come and ask for help. Those who don't go to the research office and the research office sends them to us. But also we, we have a phenomenal team of faculty and staff in the libraries who have really built up their expertise over the last half dozen years. They are interacting with researchers. They are providing the events and training and raising awareness. And we, we also see that researchers in particular disciplines are being informed and influenced by disciplinary norms as well as by the growing expectation from journal editors that there be links to their data sets before an article is published. And I'll, I'll pause there. Well, I, I, 
I know that we we talked about how this this conversation might flow, but I want to jump a little bit to one of the major problems with effective data management is the documentation and the addition of quality metadata. And those aspects take both time and skill. Now, the library community has the, the skill in the context of providing or adding quality metadata, but the former uh, problem of documentation is probably a much larger issue. So how do you see the resource constraint challenges playing into the library's ability to successfully support data management? Yeah, it, it, it's a very real problem. Um, you know, we risk being a victim of our own success if we build demand. Uh, we very much jeopardize our ability to serve that demand. Uh, I think we need to recognize that, you know, certainly in a, a technological university like Carnegie Mellon, we are very much shifting from being a collecting institution to being a professional service organization. Now, we've always been a bit of both. We always will be a bit of both, but the emphasis is certainly shifting towards the expertise that we provide. And we need to figure out, or, or I, I guess I need to figure out with my provost, how do we shift our budget from a collections focus to a service focus that requires more money for salaries and more space for people than for little used print collections. Um, I've talked already about you know, creative budget approaches like tapping into research grants. One thing that I've observed over many years is that librarians, and it seems to be a global phenomenon, love to add on new services, but rarely bite the bullet and discontinue things. And, and one, uh, one thing we maybe need to look more closely at is what can we stop doing to allow us to really uh, meet needs for new services, whether it's data management or something completely different. Well, just because I know we're running close to time, the most important thing I'd like to ask you right now is what do you see as the emerging trends with regard to effective data management? What do you think, of, what should we be thinking about over the course of the next three to five years? Uh, Sure. So, so we, we've touched on some of this already, you know, the, the growth in mandates, um, the need to ensure that repositories are capable of managing data deposits in addition to, to publication deposits. And the NIH has published some good guidance there, figuring out how much storage we're going to need. Um, you know, a fixed share account probably isn't going to cut it as we see petabytes of data come into our repositories. Uh, here at CMU, we are partnering with um, a cloud laboratory company called Emerald Cloud Lab, and they're based in San Francisco, run by two CMU alumni, and they will be helping us open the first academic cloud lab um, early in 2022. The broad principle behind a cloud lab is that it is a, a discrete facility, in our case it will be away from campus, where a combination of robotic research apparatus and technicians will conduct the bench research that is coded and transmitted to the off-site laboratory by researchers who remain on campus. And these laboratories have the potential to run 24 seven. The end product is that the researcher will receive back the data from their job. And what we anticipate happening there is a real explosion in the volume of data that is generated from research projects. And we need to understand how we cope with that data deluge. 
but also how we navigate the process of making that um, shareable and discoverable. And that probably is, is, is one of the biggest things that we need to really understand. And I think there may be an opportunity at a CNI event later in the year to, to learn a bit more about our thinking. The other point I would call out here, again, referencing some work from my colleague Hannah Gunderman, is um, recognizing the importance of inclusive RDM. And often people like me like to stand up at conference platforms and talk about best practices. And we need increasingly to recognize that best practice doesn't necessarily capture the diversity of researchers, their age, their um, gender, their cognitive abilities, race, and such things. And we need to ensure that we don't either appear condescending or discouraging and think about how we can provide support to our entire user, user or researcher community uh, in a way that it is accessible. Uh, and with that, um, Jill, I'll hand back to you. There are many more things to say, but I'm conscious of time. And I'm very sorry that time sometimes cuts into what our major issues that require so much investigation and so much consideration um, if only to fulfill the, the obligation that the information community has.